Good morning. Welcome back. Um, I want to draw your attention this morning, if I can, to um, a scripture in the Old Testament and a part of a story that uh, you probably have heard or know about, uh, and that is the story of uh, Moses returning to Egypt to be led of God to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Um, if you've seen movies like the Ten Commandments with um, Charlton Heston or other movies like that, you kind of know a little bit about the story. Um, but we know that there were ten plagues, right? We had uh, a list of things there, and I'm not going to go through all of those today. But uh, we know that the first one was uh, turning the water into blood, and that was sort of just horrific uh, an image of all the water and blood. It just had to be an, a, a, an absolute sobering feeling. So, but the second plague was frogs, right? Uh, and I want to read just for a second, just to give you the context of this, the second plague, which is found in Exodus chapter 8, uh, verse number 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite you, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you and your people and all of your servants. Now get that again. Frogs. Frogs. Maybe you like frogs. Maybe you like Maybe frogs are your thing. Maybe you like frogs. Maybe you collect frogs. I don't know. I'm not the big fan of frogs. Uh, frogs are kind of weird to me. They look a little weird. They, especially bigger toe. It just. But look at that. I'm gonna go through the list. He said the river's gonna give it abundantly. They're gonna come in your house, in your bedroom, on your bed, into your the house of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowl. I mean, even in your food, you're gonna be cooking frogs. You're going to be making frogs with your with your your bread. It's going to be frogs everywhere. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds and calls frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought frogs up from the land of Egypt, which is crazy to me. Because not only did God bring all these frogs, but the Pharaoh's magicians thought, well, you know what? We can do that too. Let's bring more frogs. So there were frogs everywhere. Can you imagine right now where you're watching today if you were sitting there and covering every place in your home or in your car or wherever you were taking in this broadcast from today? There was frogs on the chairs, frogs on your couch, frogs in your kitchen. Open up your fridge, frogs in there. Open up your oven, frogs in there. Go to your bathroom, frogs in there. Lay in your bed at night, frogs everywhere. I mean, get this image. This is exactly what was going on. It wasn't like you could go, oh, frogs are only outside, I'll come inside. No, they were everywhere. They were in your house. They were in your food. They were everywhere. So you get in your car, frogs. You go to work, frogs. You, you know, you, you try to lay down at night, there's frogs everywhere. You go to your bathroom, frogs. You take a bath, frogs. You, you're sitting at the dinner table, sitting there with your food, and frogs are jumping all over your food. There's frogs everywhere. Then Pharaoh, after the frogs had taken over, then Pharaoh, verse number 8, called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Pharaoh says, okay, I give up. I'm done with the frogs. I can't handle the frogs. I'm so tired of the frogs. And Moses said to Pharaoh, accept the honor of saying when I shall intercede for you, for your servants, for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your house, that they remain in the river only. So he said, when do you want this to happen? Moses asking Pharaoh, basically saying, when do you want this to take place? When are you ready to give up? And this is absolutely a staggering response. Pharaoh said to him, tomorrow. Tomorrow. This is absolutely a staggering reply to the condition that Egypt and Pharaoh were currently in. He's in a situation, and the people of Egypt are in a situation where literally 
They are absolutely covered with frogs. I wish for an illustration this morning I could have uh, gone to the pet store or wherever else or gone outside. I've got a pond outside my house this morning uh, that's across the road. That's a, a, a pond when it rains, it fills up. And at night, you can hear the echo of the choir of the frogs. There are frogs. Literally, it's, it's almost, I don't want to say it's deafening, but it is, it is a huge amount of frogs. I could have gone out there and, and collected up 50 frogs and brought them in here and laid them everywhere to kind of bring this image. But I, I don't even think we can grasp the totality of the, the situation where you literally have, the Bible said there are frogs in their house, frogs in their servant's house, frogs in their bed, frogs in their bathroom, frogs in their kitchen, frogs in their oven, frogs in their food, frogs, 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 frogs. You would think that somebody dealing with that would literally be willing to do anything to get rid of them. Several years ago, uh, the house my wife and I uh, lived in when we got married, um, it was on Sandy. It was a very sand. It was a. It was an older house, and when they built it, they built it with um, a lot of fill dirt, and the dirt that they used was extremely sandy. And so, because of that, it became a ant resort. I mean, we had ants everywhere, and um, they seemed to have all congregated in our, on our property. And so, because of that, um, we started having ants enter our home. Uh, in abundance. It got to the point that literally if you left a crumb on the floor, just a crumb, not even, I mean, forget food, you drop food. If you left a crumb, you'd come up the next morning and there'd be ants in droves uh, coming in the house. And so it got to the point where we, we just got tired of the ants and we, we called the, the, the exterminator. We said, you know, we need somebody out here ASAP. This is becoming a point where I mean, we were, we couldn't even leave food out. We couldn't put food, our, it was, it, we were getting into a pl our food. They were getting into different aspects and it was starting. And it was just in a, it was just in the kitchen area mainly, but it was getting to the point where like, we were so desperate. I can't imagine that times a thousand. Paint that picture just for a moment where, where you are in your life that, you know, you have this sort of problem has taken over ever. You can't get away from it. And not only that, but frogs are not only are they, maybe you think frogs are cute. Maybe you do. But to me, frogs are just, they're just ugly. They're just slimy and ugly. Forgive me, I don't want to offend the frog community. I'm sure somebody out there thinks frogs are wonderful and beautiful and they're just the cutest thing. And I'm offended you by saying this, but I'm sorry. It's my opinion and I'm not saying I'm right. It's just my opinion. You have your opinion. You can kiss frogs and make them into a prince. I'm telling you right now, frogs are just looked they just look ugly. They're slimy. And then they're loud. So can you imagine not only you're dealing with these frogs and they're nasty and they're gross and they're hopping, but then they're just loud. They're just loud and you've got this deafening noise. You can't go anywhere in your house because the noise is everywhere. And everywhere you go, there's noise. Loud. And so Pharaoh finally says, I give up. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I don't want the frogs anymore. And Moses says, okay, tell me when you want this to happen. And then he says, something that is just crazy to me. He says, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Wait a minute. If you're living with that many frogs and someone says to you, I'll get rid of the frogs, what's your response? What would be the natural response to that? Shouldn't it be now? Like, I want you to take these frogs out right now. Take it out now. Get rid of these frogs right now. But Pharaoh says tomorrow. Can you imagine what that must have been like to spend one more night with frogs? One more night with frogs. Can't imagine what that must. How? Where is your mind that you're willing to spend one more night with the frogs? What am I meaning by that? Am I not here today to talk about frogs, amphibians. I'm not here to give you a zoo, zoological lesson. There's a lot of us right now that we have frog type stuff in our life. We got stuff going on. We got stuff that's hitting us from every side. We've got stuff happening. We've got things that are that are that are 
falling apart. We have trouble on, and, and things happening. And God's saying, I'll deal with this. When do you want it done? But, you know, if, you, if I'm going to deal with this, it wasn't like Pharaoh was just saying, I give up. It was, okay, if you do this, you got to let us go. And so ultimately, he wasn't willing to let go until the next day. And so we're in, so we have all this stuff going around us. That God's trying to change our hearts, but we're willing to live with the frogs of our life instead of accepting the change that God is trying to bring about in our life. How stubborn and willful do you have to be to be willing to live life another night with frogs everywhere in your bed, in your sheets, in your clothes, in your hair, probably jumped on your face. And you're willing to spend one more night with the frogs. You see, the Bible talks about this idea that God is working on our lives even when there are times where we don't know he's working because God starts working on you before you even know and recognize him so if you're here today and you're watching and you haven't even you don't really know anything about God and you go well, I don't really know if God's working I'm going to tell you this right now God's already at work You'll recognize it one day, but he's still at work. There's a scripture in the Bible, and I'll refer to it, Romans chapter 5. Romans is in the New Testament. If you uh, have your Bible or you want a Bible, it goes uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans being the sixth book of what we call the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing tribulations, knowing tribulations produce or worketh perseverance and perseverance, character and character hope. There was a, a progression started with, started with uh, tribulation, but it produced a, 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 a result that went from perseverance to character, from character to hope. There was a progression. God was bringing things into my life. Tribulation was taking place. And ultimately, we're going to get to in a moment that God is not causing, but God allows. There's a difference that God doesn't stop it. God doesn't say, you know what? I want you to, um, boom, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're just going to have a bad day, boom. But he doesn't stop your bad day. Why? Because he uses those things in our life to bring us to a place where he can uh, help us grow and change. And then finally, if you go with me to James chapter 1, I'm going to read one more scripture here. And then I want to share with you something. Uh, my brother, in verse number 2, my brother, count on joy when you fall into various trials. I've, I've taught about this verse recently here in Antioch West. I've read this verse. I just can't come to my senses on sometimes the, the attitude behind when you fall into various trials, rejoice, find joy in it. Doesn't sound like something we want to do, right? We don't want, you know, right now, if I said, hey, guess what? Tomorrow you're going to wake up, probably going to have the worst Monday of your life. You wouldn't be going, are you serious? Really? Oh, I can't wait. I, actually, can I want to go to bed right now? Because I just want to sleep the rest of the day so I can get to Monday so I can have the worst day of my life. But James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. That word produce, worketh, causes. It's a cause and effect. It's, it's changing. You see, most of us start off as an orange. We start off in one condition. Now, for practicality's sake today, uh, my wife was so kind to slice these up for me. But uh, in reality, we start off as an orange. We, we start off in one state, one condition. And not only that, but we find that life is a series 
of transitions. Life is a series of change. To anyone that's ever said, I've changed once and never had to change again, then you need to change because life is a series of changes. Life's a series of transitions. Uh, we talked about just a minute ago, read in scripture, Romans talks about perseverance to character, character hope. God's never done working. He's transitioning you through different things, different phases. You might be transitioning through a season of faith. And when you get that down, you go through a transition of, transition of trust and then grace and then hope and then peace. So the idea that you finally find that perfect utopic existence where finally you get to the point and say, I've reached the top and I'm never going to go through anything again. I'm never going to be west messed with again. It's not the reality of what God is about. You see, most people have four basic fundamental things that are at the top of their value list. This is even more so, I think, in America. But at, at the core, uh, we have four values that we really strive for. Safety, security, comfort, and convenience. Safety, to security, comfort, and convenience. You see, here's the point with that. Depending on where you are in societal rungs, depends on which one of those is a priority to you because you see if you are in a uh, low income situation or you don't have a lot of money or you're just trying to make it by your first concern is your safety you're just trying to make it through you're just trying that's where it is and then once you get enough of that settled you got you feel like you're okay there then you move into security you want to feel secure you want to feel safe but you also want to feel secure you want that you, you want your safety kind of keeps everything out. Security kind of keeps the foundation settled. You want everything. Okay. All right. Safety. No one's going to, I'm, I'm able to stop the intruders from coming in and security is I've got enough coming in every month to pay my bills. So I live in the safety security and some of you, that's what you do. You live from paycheck to paycheck, right? And then once you get past that phase, we go into comfort. You start getting a better car of, a little nicer house, a little better clothes. Maybe you start being able to travel a little bit. You get a little more comfort. You get to go out to eat every once in a while. Maybe you now you can update when you go into the store, to the grocery store, instead of buying the this, you can buy that. And now you can spend a little while every once in a while and get yourself a treat. And every once in a while you can go on Amazon and buy yourself something. Or you can go to the store and get yourself something because now you're into comfort. And then eventually if you get through that where now you've got enough to have comfort, then you want convenience. You want all of it. You just want to make it the life as easy as possible. And you go through these things and, and at the core right now, if I could examine your life, I would see there's a striving in you that's built into the human part of it of safety, security, comfort, and convenience. Now, sometimes you could be striving for all four. There may be times, depending on where you are with your health, your mental well-being, your financial well-being, your family situation, that one may be more important than the other. But at the core, it's safety, security, comfort, and convenience. Here's the problem with that. If you read the scripture at all, you will read the fact that the Bible is not real big on safety, security, comfort, and convenience. That may be what we're trying to produce but that's not what God is. It said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have difficulties. Well, there goes security. You've got an enemy that's warring around like a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Well, there goes my security. Well, you know what, Paul? Paul talked about all the things that he suffered. Well, there goes my comfort. And the Bible talks about to know him, the fellowship of his suffering. Well, I've lost my security, I've lost my safety, I've lost my comfort, and Lord knows, the Bible says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross. Well, there goes convenience. But see, the problem is because those are sort of the American values that we strive for. Go, on, go online right now, go watch TV, look at the commercials. They're gonna to speak to four different things. Those commercials are gonna sell you something. They're gonna sell you safety, security, comfort, convenience. Take this and you're going to have a better health. That's going to give you more security. Buy this car. It's going to make life better. That's going to be more comfort. 
comforting. Or better yet, this car has better safety features, right? Security, safety. Everything that's being done. And this idea that now, and the problem is we bring that idea to the church and sadly churches have caved to this mentality where now they're purveyors of the same four characteristics. We just wrap them up in spiritual things. If you come to God, God's going to bless you. If you come to God, God's going to give you everything. He's going to give you. He's going to make everything. And you're never going to have a bad day. You're never going to have to walk through anything. And all of a sudden, because I want safety and security. So God now is my place of safety and security. The problem with that is, guess what? If you've lived, if walked with Jesus for any length of time at all, you'll know that's not always safety and security, comfort and convenience. Because why? You're an orange. You're an orange. That's who you are, right? But here's the problem. God desires you to be orange juice. God desires for you to be in a different state that you're in. God desires for you to change to the Bible talks about discipleship being formed into his image. God wants to take you from being the orange to being juice. He wants to change who you are. It would be awesome today if I could somehow go, okay, God, do it, Jesus. And he's like, okay, you want it. I'm going to give it to you. Here you go. All done. Here's here. There you are. The juice is loose. You're now juice. Oh, my goodness. Wasn't that easy? Unfortunately, the first thing God tries to get you to do, God tries to get you to pour out everything that you know about yourself. The first thing God wants you to become is completely empty. So God spends a lot of time putting you in places and bringing you to the plate where you, place where you can be completely empty. But the problem is you're an orange. But God's trying to change you. Guess what? The only way from you to go to this to that, there's got to be a mechanism or something that can help you transform. So God, being God, and his desire to change you and to transform you, brings about things in our life. You see, you cannot be an orange and go to orange juice without there being some kind of external mechanism of change. I know we talk about the inside a lot, about our inside, which is important. It's the most important thing to God about our, our inward man. But God uses the outside things to change the inside things. If you don't believe me, go through scripture. It's just story after story of external things producing change in the internal. You see, you can't change in a vacuum. You can't change in a sterile environment of nothing so that all you can do is focus on me. All I hear now is people saying to people, you know, I, I, I'm not saying, I'm knocking this. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. So I can't say who it is. I'm just speaking at this if i if we, we keep everyone keeps telling take time for you focus on you and that will make you happy well how do you focus on you when jesus is telling you to deny yourself now i'm not saying we we should you know give to the point where we wear ourselves out and we should be the point where we you know we think someone says uh humility is not thinking bad of yourself where we just we're walking around going oh i'm just I'm not thinking of myself. I'm, so, I'm just like, no. But you see, the problem is some of you are fighting against the mechanism God is using to transform you. Because you see, the orange cannot change in and of itself. If I put this orange here, I can pray over it all I want. Oh, Heavenly Father, you created the orange trees. You place them into Florida. You cause the seed of the orange to produce a tree, and therefore I have seen the oranges appear 
off the limbs from the fruit of the partaking of the rain and the sun. But Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you would take this orange and you would transform it into some orange juice and let the juice flow, Father, like nectar in the promised land. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, let it happen right now. And then we get real serious, like, I bind the adversary right now that's keeping this juice from flowing out of this orange. I rebuke you, Satan, from keeping the juice from flowing. Let the flute, let, let it flow right now. Satan, get thee behind me. Let it happen right now. The juice flow. Let it flow. Satan, flow. Nothing. You can rebuke it. You can call it. You can name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. It ain't going to change. So then guess what? The orange gets desperate. The orange then says to the creator, whatever you have to do, I want to be like you. Whatever you have to do, shape me and mold me. And the creator says, okay. And then the creator puts situations in our life that begin to squeeze us, begin to cause us to feel things or to experience things we don't like and it presses and it pushes and it squeezes and we don't like it. We don't want to be here. God, change this. God, get rid of this. I don't like this, God. What are you doing? Wait a minute. I wanted to be, I wanted to be, I wanted to be different. I didn't want to go through this. I was asking to be different. What are you doing? I'm changing you. I'm molding you. I'm making you. But wait a minute, God. I I I was I I I, I want to be different. I want to be changed, but but God, if you could, could we do it a little different way? Could we do it another way? I mean, I mean, come on, can we do this? How about you just wave some kind of magic fairy dust over my head and I'll change? But God, God, what wait a minute. Finances. Shh. Job. Family. Marriage. Hurt. Your past. God, why'd you allow that to happen to me? Why wouldn't you stop them from doing that? Because I want you to become juice. But in order to do that, I've got to put you in a situation that's going to cause it to transform you. But God, but God, make it stop. No, because it's working for your good. But God, it hurts. I know, but it's working for your good. It's transforming you. I've called you to be different. I've called you to change. I've called you to walk in places and to see me. But in order to do that, there's got to be something in your life that brings about this change. There's got to be something in your life that begins to cause change. And little by little, situation by situation, God just begins to push and to squeeze and to mold and to bend and to cause the God does this until there's nothing left of our old ways. It's just empty. It's just squeezed out. Till what we used to be is removed. Until God is beginning little by little to transform us. It doesn't always happen in one huge process. Doesn't always happen overnight. Doesn't take place. But here, it's one thing if it's circumstance, but what happens sometimes if it's somebody you love or someone grabs a hold of you and then they squeeze? What if it's a loved one? What if it's somebody in your circle of trust that God allows to be the person that squeezes some stuff out of you? You see, 
not volunteering for that, right? I didn't want that. I, I wanted, I, I wanted to be different. But could we do it another way? I wanted to be different, God. But could we do it a little differently? I mean, could we do it in some? I like this way better. Oh, holy God, make a change. Oh, holy God, calls it to change, 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 change. Please, God, change. And God says, I am doing it, but I'm going to do it my way. My way. I want to transform you. You see, that's why I can't say that they are orange. Don't worry, little fella. It's okay. You hang in there. It's okay. You hang in there. No. It's, you know what? Little buddy, submit to it because it's transforming you, making you, transitioning you. I don't know what this is in your life today. I don't know what this is for you. I, I don't know what's causing this to take place in your life. I don't know if that's family, a job, your health. But right now, every one of us has one of these in our life. That's why the... The book of Romans, a little further, we read in chapter 5, but chapter 8, it says this. It says, all things work together for good. And I love that verse to stop right there. But it continues, to them that are called according to his purpose. If you want to see the good, you've got to see things differently. You know what? For this orange... That's not a good experience. This thing has got everything, it's just hollowed out now. It's squeezed out. But now it's been transformed. It's been changed. It's changed from one state. If you want to take water and make it into ice, if you want to transform it into something different, you've got to put it in a place where the outside temperature changes to below 32 degrees. If you do that, that water can change from water to ice, something different. You see, God is using external things in our life to change us. God is trying to use things in our life, whether or not this is your, you know, you, you watch every week, you've been walking with Jesus for many, many years. Can I tell you, God never stops. Because we saw he went from perseverance to uh, to uh, 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 character, from character to hope. It continues. It's never a stop. You never stop saying, okay, there's no more. It's just God just keeps cutting up oranges, basically. He says, okay, I got, how about more? And God just has a hope. Trust me, his orchard is huge. His, I think it's called a citrus grove. I mean, it's not an orchard. Orchard is apples. His grove of orange trees is unlimited. He'll just keep cutting up orange trees in your life because you'll never stop. But for those of you that are just starting your journey with God or you're trying to find God and you're wondering, why has all this happened in my life? Why has why all this taken place? Because God wants to take all of the hurt, all the pain, all the disappointment, all the things that got you here so he can use those things to transform you into something I want to be orange juice today. But there's a lot of days I just feel like an orange. And I've prayed that prayer not knowing what I was praying for. God, change me. Transform me. God says, okay. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, God. I just want to be like you. Whatever you get is okay. I got it. All right. And then you hear the clapping of the trial and circumstance coming. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Time out. Is there another way to do this, please, God? Could it just, I mean, seriously, I like this way better. Just, can we just pretend? God's like, no, this is work. 
And, and, and guess what, Joel? It's for your good. Some days I'm like, it's easy for you to say because you're not the one being squeezed. He was like, I was bruised. I was chastised. I was rejected. I was beaten. I was cast aside. I was crucified. Because I changed through the same mechanism I'm calling you to change. But you know what's so sad? Some of us are willing to spend another night with the frogs instead of accepting God's change in our life. Some of us are willing to live with the frogs another night. Miserable. Oh, I'm tired of my life. I'm, I want change. I want to, when do you want to change? Tomorrow. There's an old song. Some of you would know this group. Some of you don't. There's an old song by this group called the Winans. Very famous group, especially back in the 80s. And they sung this song. Some of you know the song. But it's, tomorrow, I give my life tomorrow. Talking about giving your life to God and coming to the end of yourself and finally get up. But tomorrow. And eventually, the whole purpose of the song is, what if tomorrow never comes? What if you're looking for a tomorrow that never comes? And as long as it stays in tomorrow. But the Bible says, choose you to day it's a day now it's a moment it's now some of you god is bringing everything in your life right now not to punish you but to get you to the point where you're willing to say god not tomorrow but today the bible doesn't say this but i wonder if god decided you know what pharaoh you don't want to change i'll throw a few more frogs in your bed you don't want to change i'll throw a few more frogs in your bathroom on your breakfast table Does that mean God is mean? God's sitting up there going, if they don't want to change, I'm just going to make them miserable. No, but God's so desperate to make us into something great that he's willing to subject us to things that we don't understand and we can't see that because he sees the transformation and he sees where we are, but he sees where he's taking us. But we're willing to live with the frogs another night instead of accepting God's change. How are the frogs doing today? When you woke up this morning, some of you were greeted by the croaking of the frogs in your life. Some of you, when you, when you, when you went to bed last night, the last thing that you heard before the sleep came over you was the croaking of the frogs. When you got up this morning, you the croaking of the frogs. When you woke up in the middle of the night for a moment and you stirred, you still heard the croaking of the frogs. And when you, when you turn this off and you try to go about your day, you're going to hear the frogs. You're going to hear the frogs. They're going to be everywhere. You can't escape them. They're everywhere. They're in your life. They're in your work. They're in your business. They're in your pleasure. You can't get away from them. The frogs are everywhere. And God's saying, if you would just let me take control, if you would just submit yourself and come to the end of yourself, this isn't the way it's got to be. But we're saying, okay, God, I'm willing. God says, when? Tomorrow. I'm willing to spend one more night with the frogs than accept change in my life. God's calling us to be different. God's calling us to change. God's calling us to transform. But we can't transform without trials and situations so you know what i gotta be frank with you this is the problem i have modern christianity has tried to remove this out of our life modern christianity has tried to tell you god loves you so much he would never let anything happen to you then how do you tell that to somebody who's standing along the bedside of their child watching their baby breathe their last breath? How do you say that if it's not for the fact that God is bigger than our understanding? 
God will never let anything happen to you. He'll supply your needs. And then you get that note tomorrow from the from your boss saying, we've got to let you go. And you have nowhere to go. And you don't know where it's going to come from. What do you do then? God see? God lied? No, no. He sees bigger than we see. I haven't come here today to paint you the Willy Wonka fairy tale, magic wand version of God. I've come to tell you that through his love and desire to transform you, there's going to be some times where it's not going to feel good. There's going to be some times where you're going to have to find a place where you get on your knees and you say, okay, God, I don't like it. I don't understand it, but I'm willing to submit myself to whatever, God, to whatever, whatever you're wanting to do, whatever you're trying to do in my life, I'm coming to that and submitting to it right now. And God says, okay, and instead of God going, all right, you're right, let's, okay, that's the case, I'll let you up. God goes, okay, great, now let me just squeeze harder. You ever prayed for something to change, but instead of changing, it got worse? Seriously, there was a point in time, every time I prayed for something, instead of getting better, it got worse. I was like, you know what? I'm not praying anymore. This is ridiculous. Every time I pray, it gets worse. Because you know what? I got to find, I was praying for God to change the circumstance, but I wasn't praying for God to change me. That was the problem. I just didn't realize it at the time. I'm like, God, you not see what I'm going through. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, whatever you got to do, you've got to do something, God. You've got to do something. And God's like, okay. And it got worse. And then I'm like, so then I'm like, did I not cry enough? I'm like, you know, you know, putting a needle in my leg to make myself cry. I'm like, I'll do whatever I got to do, God. I'll do tears, whatever. Do you need tears? I got tears. I mean, I'm cutting onions up in the house trying to make myself cry. God, help me change. It's God, you got to change. Is that enough tears you have for you to change? And it gets worse. Because ultimately I wasn't praying for God to change me. I was trying to get God to change my circumstance. But the whole time God was actually trying to change me using my circumstance. And to the point now where I come to the point and say, God, change me. And when my circumstances get worse, I go, thank you, Father, because your grace is sufficient. This last 13 months, I will tell you, there have been times in my flesh that I pray, God, change this. Do something. Change all of this. And not only has God not changed it, he's taken it further. But his grace is sufficient. Maybe today you feel like this. And God comes along and the first thing he does is open up your heart, slices it open. You're like, well, that was hard. But thank God that's over. I don't have to go through that again. Maybe God causes things to happen in your life that cut deeply. To cut you, slice you open to expose you, to feel like you're vulnerable now. You're exposed. Well, that's got to be it now. I feel like I've been hurt. I've been wounded. I've been cut. That's it. That must be me. God's over. And God says, okay, part one's done. Now let part two begin. And God lets other things start to happen that begin to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And the whole time we're going, wait a minute. I was okay if you just left me like this. Leave me alone, God. Just keep me the way I was. But God says, yeah, I haven't called you to be an orange I've called you to be the juice. But to go from the orange to the juice, first thing that's got to happen, you got to be cut open. Second thing has got to happen, you've got to be subjected to some external things to, in order to squeeze the transformation out of you. Some of you right now, God's trying to squeeze the transformation out of you. He's trying to have you empty out all the old stuff so that what he has put in you can come to light. But you've got to be willing to say, yes, Lord. There's an old song we used to sing when I was growing up. We don't sing it as much anymore, but I love it. It's a simple song that says, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Would you say yes to Jesus today? Would you say yes to him? 
whether this is your first time watching or you watch every week, would you say yes to Jesus? Would you say yes to him? Say, God, I say yes to the trials. I say yes to the difficulties. I say yes to the circumstances. I say yes to you. I want to be this, but I know to be this, I've got to walk this so that you can transform me. Father, I thank you today. I pray now, Lord, by your help and grace that you would speak your word to each one of us. Every one of us is in a different place, a season of our life. You know the end from the beginning. But Father, I pray today by your grace that you would continue to work in us as you draw. Your word says that nobody comes to you except they're drawn by the Father. I can feel the drawing today. But Lord, sometimes your path is not a path of smooth sailing, calm seas. Sometimes the path you bring us on is rocky, it's stony, it's filled with potholes, it's filled with high waves and strong winds, but not for our punishment, but for our protection, for our, our, our transformation. Not to destroy us, but to change us. Lord, there's some of us that have gotten so tired of living with the frogs in our life, but Lord, we're putting off change until tomorrow to live with the frogs another light, a night. Lord, I pray today that you would prick our heart one more time, that we would come to the end of ourselves, that finding you and change would be greater than our pride, would be greater than our way, and whether or not you take the frogs away, that's irrelevant. We just want you. I pray in Jesus' name today, Lord, that you would open our eyes, that we can see what you're doing. Open our ears, that we can hear your voice clearly. And open our heart, that we can receive what you're putting into us. In Jesus' name. For those that are, are watching today that are battling with hurt and pain and difficulty, and they don't understand what's going on, and they don't understand why things keep happening to them. And every time they turn around, it feels like there's something else hitting them in the face, and they're wondering, God, where are you? What are you doing? Let them see today that what's happening is a place of transition and transformation, not a place of punishment, not a place of forgetful. You haven't left them. You haven't forgotten them. You're transforming them. If they would see it, embrace it, and understand it. And when you're done that, God, there'll be a new season, more oranges to come. But Lord, you're at work. Whether we can see it or not, you're at work. Whether we like it or not, you're at work. And I pray today in Jesus' name, by your grace, you would continue to move in our life. In Jesus' name, praise God. God bless you. Thank you for joining today. I pray that you are challenged by this word. If you're a part of a life group, go take this word, digest it, challenge each other with it. Challenge yourself with it. Apply it. Maybe today you'll realize what God is doing and that you're willing to continue down that path. You don't like it, but you know it's for your good because he is good. Praise God. We talked about it this morning. Come hang out with us tonight right at home. We're doing the uh, relatable Bible character challenge. Come talk, share your opinion, cast your vote. Be a part of that. We're trying to find what's the most relatable biblical character outside of Jesus. We did take Jesus off the table because he'd win every time. But what's the most relatable Bible character in 2021? We got Joseph. He's in the top four. We'll find out tonight who is the second entry into our top four. And then next week, we'll get into the New Testament and see what I got. My I've got a dark horse in the New Testament. I think the woman at the well is going to go far because she's so relatable and so speaks to us in 2021. But if you don't know that story, John chapter 4, go read it so you can give your opinion as well. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 730. If not, we'll see you Tuesday night on uh, Tuesday Talks here on YouTube and Digging Deeper as well. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Go be a part of your life group and challenge and change as God leads in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you again next time.